Go to any city, any town, and any rest stop in America, and you're bound to find the same old shopping centers with the same stores and the same gas stations and the same fast food as any other city. How did just a few companies gain monopoly over the entire country? You know which companies I'm talking about. The Coca-Colas, the Shells, the Comcasts, you name it. <laughs> Hello everyone, ThoughtMonkey here. Today we'll be exploring how corporations came to be so powerful and how they have come to dominate our shopping centers and politics. First, a little bit of background about what a corporation is. The word corporation comes from the Latin word corpus, which means body of people. In fact, in ancient Roman law, corporate entities were recognized and even given protection under the law. Similarly today, by definition, a corporation is simply a group of people who have been authorized by law to act as a single legal entity. And while most of the time we use the word corporate negatively, corporations are not innately bad. They can be bad or good, just like people. However, over the past hundred years, corporations have gained certain legal rights that have allowed them to gain more and more power. Again, some use their power responsibly for good, while others recklessly for bad. Think Google versus ExxonMobil. Corporations today are super powerful for a number of reasons. First, corporations are allowed to create political action committees, or PACs for short, which are basically organizations that pool money from members and donate those funds to campaign for or against candidates, ballot initiatives, or legislation. For example, AT&T donated nearly $3 million during the 2016 campaign cycle on funding the campaigns of possible representatives they believed would put out legislation in AT&T's best interest. Second, corporations tend to spend a lot of money on lobbying in Washington in the hopes of influencing politicians on a particular issue. For example, the oil company ExxonMobil has spent over $200 million alone over the past 20 years on lobbying. Just in 2008, the company spent over $29 million in an effort to defeat legislation that addressed climate change. Not only do corporations donate millions of dollars to the politicians they know will act in their best interest, or spend hundreds of millions of dollars on expert influencers trying to get those politicians to sign or block legislation that will help or hurt their companies, but they also employ many revolvers, or people who are at one time government employees that now work for corporations, strengthening the connection between corporations and government further. Of the 29 registered lobbyists that work for ExxonMobil, 22 of them have at one time been government employees. You get the point. Of course, Exxon is just one example out of many. I don't know why I'm ragging on Exxon, but I am. And if you happen to be the CEO listening to this video, please don't come after me. I'm just using you as an example. Anyways, the point is that corporations and the government are tightly wound up within each other. So how did this happen? Before the late 1800s, corporations were required to be public service organizations and have a stated public purpose. In other words, they were sort of a gift from a group of people to serve the public good. They were tightly controlled and very limited due to widespread public opposition. In fact, the common misconception is that the Boston Tea Party was a protest between the American revolutionaries and the King of England, but rather it was a protest by the Americans against the monopolization of the tea market by the East India Company. In the mid-1800s, during the Civil War and the Industrial Revolution, there was an explosion in the growth of corporations, and with it came the belief by corporate lawyers that they needed more power to operate. Their goal was to remove certain constraints that had been placed on the corporation. After the Civil War was fought and the 14th Amendment was passed, which was created to protect freed slaves and provide them with equal protection under the law, a case was decided in 1886 between Santa Clara County and the Southern Pacific Railroad, which gave corporations protection under the 14th Amendment declaring them people. The decision read that the defendant corporations are persons within the 14th Amendment, which forbids a state to deny any person equal protection of the laws. Basically, the ruling gave corporations the right to enter into contract with other parties and sue just like you and I can do. While the original intent of passing the 14th Amendment was to protect freed black slaves, between 1890 and 1910 there were 307 cases brought before the court under it. 288 of those cases were brought to the court by corporations, while only 9 of them by freed black slaves. President Lincoln predicted the growth and power of the corporation long before such a decision was passed by the Supreme Court when he wrote during the Civil War that corporations have been enthroned and an era of corruption in high places will follow, until all wealth is aggregated in a few hands and the republic is destroyed. I feel at this moment more anxiety for the safety of my country than ever before, even in the midst of war. Since 1886, there have been at least 11 more major decisions by the Supreme Court that have given corporations additional rights. 
The most recent two that have had a huge impact on our past two elections have been the 2010 Citizens United versus FEC, which declared that the government can't limit a corporation's political donations. And in 2014, the Burwell versus Hobby Lobby case that says that corporations can assert the religious rights of their owners. The point is that corporations used to look very different than they do today. Their evolution from tightly controlled entities that were meant to serve the public to massive companies that serve themselves first and have a major influence on the political direction of this country has been a slow yet steady process. Their power has come from the decisions of many court cases which have slowly granted them more and more power. The trend is not in the public's favor, rather the corporations. The question remains, however, what now? How can the public limit the power of corporate influence in Washington? Well, the answer seems like it would be pretty simple. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up below and subscribe to stay updated with the most recent ThoughtMonkey video.